So what we wanted to do is change this up a little bit. I am going to be introducing my colleague who's on Zoom. I'm Julie Kane. I'm the Chief Learning Officer of Participate. We are a social learning platform. We support communities of practice. We work closely with Nate, who showed a lot of stuff. We are working very closely with um, folks at the MIT DCC, as well as T3. So I'll be chatting through the course of the next two days about some of the work that we're doing. And we also support um, the open recognition for everyone community. So Participate has been a very active um, participant an enthusiastic participant. And Crystal Rawls is someone that found this community about a year ago. Um, and many of uh, the folks in this room are now working with her. Um, Dr. Crystal Rawls is essentially leading something called WIN. And it's at the California State University at Dominguez Hills. And I would like Crystal actually to talk about her work. And I'm waiting for some technical support for her to be able to do that. But, it is not here. So I am going to keep on doing. So the work, WIN stands for Workforce Integration Network. And the reason that um, Crystal is working with many partners in this room is because she found a community of practice. So she's not picking technologies. She's picking the people to work with to support the work that she's doing um, in Dominguez Hills. And Dominguez Hills is a very interesting community um, as well as a campus that sits about 20 miles east of Los Angeles. Many of the students at Dominguez Hills are first generation formal students, but as we've been talking about, and Julie's incredible talk really set the stage for this, is these are folks that are coming to this university with enormous prior learning. But what Crystal described initially was the enormous labor to get these folks to self-attest all of their amazingness. And it took a lot of sort of manual labor um, to really get them to tell their stories. And so what Crystal found in the open recognition group and also with the technology of badging is a way for these folks to tell their own story, right? So that they were not just being, again, with Freire, the banking model, right? These were folks that had enormous amounts of knowledge and skills, and they needed to connect and do that code switching to connect those prior learnings with more of their formal courses. So what I found, what we found in Crystal was finally, to Jason's point, an end of this dichotomy between formal and informal, fucking badges and micro-credentials. The technology supports a holistic ecosystem, right? And so... <laughs> It's hilarious. Of course, it's going to happen. I can't believe I'm the person standing between us and cocktails. It's fucking the irony of that is not lost on me. I am telling you right now. For those who don't know me, it's unbelievable. Um, so what Wynn is trying to do is she got a $5 million grant, incredible, to close the digital divide in Dominguez Hills. So some of this broadband money in the US that came through the Biden's infrastructure, right, is doing this work, which is how do you get community-based organizations to tell everyone what they need, not to just get a dump. Are you there, Crystal? Yes! <laughs> uh, she's muted herself. Don't mute yourself. No, I can't hear you. Oh, yeah. Give uh, audio for the, can you speak? She is speaking. We could do like a, a crazy ventriloquist thing. Crystal, Hi. we've worked together. Hi. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> I was You're saving me, Crystal. Okay. I'm going to stop describing your work because that uh, irony is not lost on me here either. Oh, no. Don't go away. What? Can you still hear me? Yes. All right. I think you should start talking because we also want to connect you to the other folks that are going to kind of join the stage in a little bit. Um, to talk a little bit about the community of practice that you're working on building with WIN, the Workforce Integration Network. So just giving a little bit of context for that project um, and what you're hoping to build um, with that community of practice. Sure. Don't worry about the slide deck. I will make sure that you guys have the slide deck. <laughs> um, so I can tell you a little bit about the community of practice and the why. Um, our community of practice consists of eight local uh, um, community-based organizations and about 160 oh, interns and we're allowing our interns to share what they have learned about themselves as they're working with that's a great slide we can leave it there yes um, great. empowerment as Perfect. they're working with <laughs> our community can you guys hear me yep keep going crystal okay 
So, right. So what we're sure what we're looking at right now is an opportunity for our students. And so this is a student um, talking about his own skills and his own learning, this quote here. And it really shows how self-attestation, the ability to claim one's own skills outside of the traditional work or um, academic experience really enriches a student's experience on a college campus. So I usually refer to this slide as recognition for retention because when a student sees their journey from this lens of all of the opportunities that they've had, they can then see themselves in a way um, that they can tell their own story. And it was just really, it's really a great experience working to close the digital divide where my student decided, this data analyst in turn, I took his picture off to preserve his privacy, but my student decided that those were his skills. That's the skills that he developed and he wanted to learn. But as you see, it really wasn't part of his curriculum. These were additional skills that he learned through his internship, through he learned through um, participating with community partners that really helped him see and value the things that he had learned and experienced and that lead to his long-term success. So it's really about the community that you're in, um, right? Where people see you and recognize you and you can see yourself and recognize yourself that will help us close these really, um, you know, unique challenges that we have here in higher ed in the U.S., as well as closing the digital divide as a society globally. And Crystal, can you just um, briefly tell how the students at CSUDH, how your student interns are going to be working out in the community um, and how you see that working in terms of also giving voice to the community organizations themselves and their members in terms of how yeah, the digital absolutely. divide is going to be addressed? Yeah. Yep. Let's, let's click on uh, slide four because I think that's helpful. <laughs> Yep, next one, yeah, right there. So, um, right, this is our project essentially. Um, our 10 community-based organizations host our 160 interns. So our interns learn a particular skill pathway, be it software tools for data analytics, marketing, or project management. And then they take those skills plus their cultural wealth, so the skills that they bring to the table when they enter, enter the campus community, and then they take those, um, plus their academic, their curricular skills, right? They take those into the community. So our students are acting as digital navigators, helping people learn how to use equipment. They're helping manage projects like equipment distribution, um, marketing programs. So they're all in this community where they can not only recognize each other, I have one intern who is strictly recognizing all of our community partners for their partnership in closing the digital divide, right? And so we are rolling our interns into the community to support the community based on their experiences first and adding their curricular experiences, which results in an experiential learning experience, right? This is their work experience. Many of them have no previous experience in these fields. So it's stacking a micro-credential on top of their um, academic experience and putting them in a space where they can just simply recognize one another for the good things we bring to our community's growth. And then what are the chances for, so it, when you're thinking about the community-based organizations and the folks that are being served, boys and girls clubs, um, what are some of the other community-based organizations that are in that, ten, that list of 10? Well, um, I have several actually. Yeah. <laughs> so one of our partners is Destination Crenshaw, for example. Um, I think we have a slide here where I talk about my partners and what we've recognized about them. Um, no, I think it? it's a little later in the deck. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe not. Okay, so, oh, wait, it's it's uh, slide five. Okay. Great, thank you. So right here, here is where we're recognizing our community partners. So if you look at the side where it says, in community, we are here. Destination Crenshaw is a community revitalization program that really seeks to highlight what Black 
culture has brought to the Crenshaw district in Southern California community. And so they're here, they want to be seen. And that's what our intern picked up on. So what he did is he went to each community partner like Long Beach, um, Goodwill, we have a partner with Goodwill Industries in Long Beach, and he identified what it is that they're bringing to the community so that immediately when they enter this community, they know we value their partnership. We understand and we see their partnership. And so this is from us to our community partners. So Goodwill, they do digital skills training for older and um, not, you know, uh, people who are not enrolled in college for community partners, Destination Crenshaw, of course, community revitalization, but also Boys and Girls Club, right? College to career, K through 12 type stuff, as well as organization like Entre New, which is Comp Compton Youth Build. And they keep our young students safe after school. They give them a place to come and learn and work in a safe environment. So our partners, really contribute to the community and we want them to know we see them and as well as our interns who are bringing those actual intern. skills to the project <laughs> and i think um nan and i think i've talked about this a little bit with carrie too in terms of thinking about institutions of higher ed there are many examples like crystal right and and nan and all of the university partners that are rethinking higher ed like we cannot undermine them at least in the u.s like, they're already under attack enough, right? But it's helping them see how you make these community connections and the critical role that at least, especially public um, higher ed institutions play in their communities. And I think in terms of incre incremental cred credentialing, allowing student interns to come and do community support, breaking down the walls of that institute of higher ed so that they're a part of the community that they're most of the time physically situated in. Um, all right, I'm gonna start to bring other folks to the stage, and Crystal, do you mind staying on? Because I think um, we wanted to sort of transition to some of our other folks who seem to not be coming onto the stage, and I'm calling you. Um, can I ask if you, I may need some more support search, I don't know, if you had other um, slides that you were gonna talk to from? Is anyone else? So Crystal, hang tight because I think, um, Doug, we might have sort of a conversation with the audience as well as the other panelists. Um, but I also want to figure out if who's going next and if you have some slides to share. Doug's got it? Okay. I'm going to keep on talking. You really want me to keep on talking? Um, so, and the thing that also, just to, to come back to, to Crystal, is that we... We finally, I think this afternoon, are getting to the why. Why have been many of us doing this for 13 years? What do we think this technology can actually support? But keeping that North Star of inclusivity, right? Recognizing things that were not recognized before. So that, and you know, many of the folks that keep coming back to these gatherings really believe in this. Um, and so a lot of it is making these technologies a lot more available to many folks, creating interoperability, um, making sure we're constantly expanding our circles of who's it gets to be in Vienna, <laughs> right? Bringing more people to the table. All right, I'm going to stop. <laughs> no, hey, I'm Doug. Um, I was up here before talking about the Open Recognition Toolkit. Hi. Um, so I've assembled a fantastic panel, and these literally are the people between you and cocktails. Okay, so ask them, ask them some really hard questions. So. Um, these slides here are going to accompany the wise words that people say, um, and then you're going to ask them questions as well. Now, the whole point of this session is to, and you can't really see it because Crystal's over the top of it. There we go. Sorry, Crystal, I'm just going to move you out of the way. Um, so there's been a lot of kind of implicit juxtaposition of micro-credentialing and open recognition. And the assumption is that these two things are kind of in some kind of problematic dialectic. But actually, as these three people are going to say, these things work together in a much more holistic way than perhaps we've um, heard so far today. Um, Crystal's disappeared. Oh, whatever. So I'm just going to introduce these people um, who I know well. Uh, yes, Crystal, we saw you. Um, so first of all, I'm, I don't need any notes to introduce these wonderful people, right? Noah here, some of you, hands up anyone who was at the Badge Summit in Denver. Who's come to both? Give these people a round of applause to go to two conferences on open recognition this year. Fantastic, well done. 
it, this, the, the, the Badge Summit was NOAA's brainchild. How many years ago? Uh, 2024 will be our ninth year. Nine years of the Badge Summit, fantastic. Um, so Noah is a micro-credentials manager at the University of uh, Colorado, but also very active in the world of open recognition. Um, Kelly has been with lots of different organizations, including Digital Promise, um, and is a, is a researcher, a ethnographer, and has this kind of deep background in helping people um, be able to tell their story. That's the idea behind the work that, that she does. Um, and then Anna, who I've had the privilege of working with over the last couple of years, was first of all our intern at We Are Open Co-op and is now our collaborator. Um, and is based in Germany. So we've got two people from the US and one from Canada and me from Brexit Britain. So um, I'm going to hand over to Anna, who is going to tell a story about uh, the concept of STARS. Now, when we talk about STARS, it's just a different way, another acronym to throw into the acronym soup, um, which is skilled through alternative routes. Now, some of these people might, credential, might um, critique the idea, but other than that, I'm going to hand over to Anna and to Kelly and to Noah, and then after we've heard them speak, we can engage them in conversation, ask them some hard questions, and then go and have some cocktails. Here we go. Um, I'll move the slides for you, Anna. That's nice, thank you. Um, yeah, so this story basically isn't really a story about alternative routes, but we made it one. <laughs> because my university said, uh, you need to do an internship for 300 hours. So I applied at We Are Open and they took me in and designed this whole framework for my internship. Designed badges and said, this is, this is the plan. And I was like, okay, cool, let's do this. And uh, so I started and they didn't know how my skills worked with their work. I didn't know it either. And uh, we just got into the work and then very quickly we realized that those badges doesn't really work with what I've been doing, what we've been doing with the projects and everything, and what I've been learning. So we decided that it would be a great idea to design badges together that actually match what I want to learn, what I want to show to my university as well. And uh, yeah, that is not just a credential or something I can show to employers, but that also encourages me and my work that I'm doing. And so if you go one slide back, Doug. To give you an example, um, this is the shadow jumping badge. And this is a German idiom, to jump your own shadow. So it means to overcome yourself, to get on a stage at a conference and speak into a microphone, <laughs> for example. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is a badge that I earned very early in my internship. And since then, I've been jumping my own shadow uh, plenty of times. <laughs> so yeah, it kept encouraging me. And I think that's, yeah, and this is my backpack. I think a couple of while ago, uh, I think it's getting more and more. <laughs> Yes. Yes, yes. How many keep as well? Let's, let's thank you very much. Let's pass over to Kelly. Hi. So um, my name is Kelly. Um, I run a social design studio called Live What You Love. I'm um, a social design ethnographer by trade. So what does that mean? That means we get really close to people in communities. We listen. We help people really uncover and make visible their stories, their learnings, uh, so that we can learn together about what's going to be the most effective design experience for them uh, relative to a service, a product, uh, digital credentials, for example. So Doug asked me to sort of talk about um, how might we actually use uh, different kinds of recognition systems collaboratively together by which to recognize people along their pathways. So if you just flick to the next slide. So what I wanted to share about is over the years of, of really being part of different communities and um, sort of collecting, uncovering, and making visible different stories. And by the way, there's different protocols on how to do this. These stories are owned by the people in the communities and the community itself. It's not an extractive method where you go in and you survey and you do focus groups and you walk away with the data and the people walk away with nothing. Uh, it's where they're learning as you're uh, going throughout the experience. Tomorrow I'm gonna share a little bit more about it, um, specifically from one project. But one of the insights that's come out of this work that I've put together 
together in a white paper is around a more inclusive model of pathways. And so what Anna's been describing is her lived experience of her pathway, of her skills, of her learning. But what happened before that was an institution or a group of people got together and thought, well, these are the badges that she needs to get uh, during this experience. That's an educational pathway or an institutional pathway. It's not a lived experience of a pathway. And so what's really important is for us to start to really interrogate how we're using the term pathway uh, in our systems of recognition so that we are actually collaborating with Anna or with learners and workers for them to actually be part of the design process. One, it'll be far more uh, accepted, adopted, and used because they see themselves, therefore, in the badging. And there's language that comes out that is makes it far more usable uh, and so forth. But the inclusive model of pathways is really about recognizing that we are collectors. Um, and I know this kind of does lean into the ethnographer, we can't help but collect, but um, we are collectors every day. We're learning 24-7. We never actually stop learning, even while we're sleeping. So it's really interesting to start to recognise what are the different ways we collect, we share. Uh, younger generations are actually using technologies in really innovative ways to document their experiences visually, verbally, on video and so forth. How can we actually tap into that? Um, there's also technologies, there's one called Story Park that's specifically designed for pre-K and early childhood uh, with young people actually documenting their learning through a whole number of different methods. So lived pathways or the inclusive model recognises us as documentarians that if we're collecting as opposed to assessing of learning, we're going to get a more inclusive model and understanding of people's pathways because they're actually developing and designing them with us. So um, there's a number of slides, but if you just go to the next one, it's starting to recognise that there are these different elements, um, and I will, I'm going to hand over to Noah. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but it's starting to recognise that we can use open recognition badges, we could use micro-credentials for different things in different ways. Ways, and they could actually be used collaboratively um, to make recognition more accessible for certain people uh, or stackable if we are looking at um, stacking different credentials to a degree. But it's also recognising all the different ways we learn and all the different contexts we learn. So there's a little bit of a framework there that you can look at. But really leaning into lived experience of pathways and, re and actually trusting people to be a co-designer with us on the journey. Um, check, 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 Still check. Working. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Noah Geisel, University of Colorado Boulder, and Doug invited me to share it uh, through the lens of technological advancement and challenges, which um, I might have gotten the assignment right or wrong. We'll see. But before we get started with that, there's two things I was hoping we could acknowledge on the next slide. Um, one is just the, this word of alternative. Um, when we talk about stars, I, I think it's uh, basically centers an experience that is actually not the normal experience for most people. And so I, I, I just caution us to be very careful with that, as well as you know, acknowledging that um, a lot of the people doing the work for STARS are not people with shared uh, experiences to, for STARS. And uh, so I just want to acknowledge those two things before I dove in um, to what I was hoping to share. Thank you so much. So uh, I, I, it, when we talk about the, the technological, for me, for me, it's really about trust. And you know, I think that there's just so much opportunity and challenges. And so two things I just want to share with that um, on the next slide is you know, I, one of the things that from a technology perspective, as Serge mentioned you know, earlier this morning, what is this stuff doing that I couldn't have just read in plain text on your resume or cover letter? And I think that the technology piece is a real big uh, piece to enhancing trust and sending signals that, that help people uh, move from you know, credentials as proxies for things like essential skills to using credentials for those essential skills. Uh, this is a project that we did with a uh, 40,000 student school district in, in Colorado of you know, saying, regardless of what classroom you're in, there's different ways that you can demonstrate these essential skills across all age groups, schools, you know, but at the end of the day, we have clear earning criteria that is measurable and assessed. And that was pretty cool. And where it helps us get to 
is going from, take my word for it, I have these skills to take this trusted signal from this trust organization that I have these skills. And I think that's a really big deal. Um, next. And one of the things that we really uh, prioritize in that work is not just uh, going beyond taking the institution's word for it, that we can also add tr uh, evidence to our badge claims, right? So one of the things that does make it different from a resume, that does make it different from something you can do on a cover letter is we can actually, with that metadata, attach files or you know links to earning evidence of how did this individual human go about meeting that measurable earning criteria. And that can you know be just a huge signal when it comes to trust. And um, sorry, I'm down to one minute, 10 seconds. I think that where it takes us to, is to a place of you know, thinking, how do we mediate? How do we broker these conversations uh, around evidence and decide we have this ability to attach evidence? You know, what, how does that trust come in? And I think that, and I look forward to Doug and Laura teaching us in the coming year about credential literacy and trust literacy. You know, that when we think of, you know, my Uber profile, you know, my, Airbnb, my Google Maps guide profile. There's all these different things that are putting out there these trust signals, and some of them we trust more than others, right? Like my miniature golf score, you know, maybe nobody trusts me on that because I cheated. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but also we've had, you know, LinkedIn recommendations for a long time, and it's digital, we can see who made it, and yet nobody trusts those, right? And so I just think that while we have the ability to attach evidence um, when we make these assertions, there, there's going to be some interesting kind of literacy challenges when you think about what this technology is enabling to actually realize the promise and potential of you know, credentialing and trust um, as we meld together micro-credentials and open recognition. Sorry, I went two seconds over. Noah, you're an absolute pro. Thank you. Um, while we've still got Crystal here, Crystal, just to put you on the, on the spot, if you don't mind, um, when you're thinking about kind of the difference between micro-credentials and kind of a, a more broad open recognition um, I, um, conception, how do you kind of walk the difference between those two worlds? Because you're in an institution. How, how do you kind of demarcate um, the difference? Like where do micro-credentials end and open recognition begin? Oh, you might need We are in the midst. No, we can hear can you. Can you hear me? Okay. I think we are in the midst of learning that. Um, as we have created our taxonomy on campus, at this time, we're just recognizing that there are experiences like the student research conference, and that is an experience that has value, and the student can name whatever that value is in addition so we're just using different platforms and different systems to kind of bring the conversation together for our students right now to help them see themselves while we continue. So they get their degree, they get these micro-credentials throughout the program, throughout their learning experience on campus. They can also earn other credentials, but they can also earn recognition badges from their various organizations on campus. So we're really working toward, it's not either or, it's a spectrum of all of the experiences that um, paint the lifelong story of a student, the lifelong learning that a student encounters. Can I add one thing? Sorry, and one thing, Crystal, I was gonna add, because this gets to the conversation around retention. So um, in other presentations, Crystal's really been able to use this ecosystem to show much higher rates of retention in that pro program, as well as badging sort of contributing to that sort of sense of belonging, yeah. Okay, great. Before I open it up to people asking questions, um, I just wanted to ask a question of, of the panel and to Crystal as well, so anyone can take this question. But you all have lots of different types of credentials. You have degrees, you have postgraduate qualifications, you have different kind of badges. Is there a particular one that, um, whether it's a micro-credential or open recognition, one that particularly speaks to you right now at the moment. Now, no, we saw you flex with your kind of Uber profile and your Airbnb thing and whatever like that. That's kind of an implicit kind of credential or implicit kind of open recognition. But is there anything which for you at the moment just means something to you? It might not mean anything to you next week, but right now something that means to you. Who wants to take that? 
Um, I, I will jump in. Thanks. Um, if I, <laughs> um, so I have a PhD. I have a whole, whole bunch of tech certifications. All of these things that say the workforce values me. But the best recognition I've ever received, and I was hurriedly looking from it, was a picture my daughter drew of me where she sets me as a princess on top of the world that helps people translate. Because she recognized that, right, this 20-year-old, she, she happens to be a computer science engineer and she knows I make badges, but she wanted to recognize that I translate for communities from technology to education to um, experiences. And maybe nobody will ever see that. <laughs> maybe nobody will ever care but it's very, very important to me. It's the best recognition element I have ever received. And I frequently use that language when people ask what I do. I translate because she saw me in that moment and that was important. It reminds me of, um, so someone I know uh, got this amazing kind of um, kudos in front of all of the staff at their organization. The CEO just like called them out and said, like, we really value this hard work that you're doing. And she couldn't capture that in any way that went beyond like the room of people. And what I see open recognition is doing is capturing some of the things you're talking about there, Crystal, and some of the things in that story of the person that I know and making that evident to people beyond the people who happen to be in the room at a time. I'm gonna open this up now to questions from the audience. Um, if you wanna ask questions of Anna or Kelly or Noah, or of all three of them, um, who wants to go first? I'll run over here. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Kelly, um, I'm fascinated by what you're doing. Um, my question is, when you're working with communities that have um, intergenerational trauma, and you're asking um, them to go through their history, um, and there's a tendency to sort of um, share. How do you support when um, their pathways might be triggering or re-traumatizing? No, yeah, that's on. Um, so there's a number of different protocols and techniques. Um, before bringing uh, groups of people together as well, um, we do uh, what's called empathy interviews. Um, and so it actually sometimes can lean into being very much like therapy. Uh, where you're on a journey with them and as they're sharing. Uh, it's very important as you as a facilitator in that space in how you create space without stepping into it um, and provide support for them along that journey. What's really interesting in some of the protocols, and I'm happy to share some of those as well, um, is that when you're in that space where the trauma is triggered or uh, an experience, um, it's how you show up so that you're not um, re-traumatizing uh, or um, in any way, shape or form um, minimizing what that experience is, but just holding the space for it um, and going with them on that journey. Um, but it's, it's always very different. Uh, there's a number of experiences. Uh, so for example, some work I did uh, last year in Texas on the Mexico-Texas border with um, uh, health professionals, nurses, uh, nursing staff, um, uh, all of them in, in the community were also immigrants that had um, moved to America from Mexico. Um, and what was interesting that there was a shared um, experience around they got into healthcare because they had supported a member of their family as a teenager, as young as seven and eight, who had needed healthcare at home. And so an example of that is being in that space with them as they unpacked that experience, but also their recognition of themselves in what they learned. So you're bringing um, a recognition for what they've learned along that, that journey. But there's, it's called empathy interviews. Happy to share some of the protocols for that. Um, always starting one-on-one -on -one so that you're getting to know the different individuals um, before you bring them into a group situation, for example, as well. But it's really important to lean into that.
Thanks, Kelly. Um, any other questions from the audience? Sorry, I didn't mention Crystal before. Obviously, you can ask questions of Crystal, too. Everyone's got cocktail-shaped emojis in their eyes at the moment. Oh, Nate, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Anne and uh, Crystal, I think this uh, could go for both of you. What is the interplay as you're sort of defining badges as you go between sort of what do you get right the first time you, you name that thing and what do you learn after you've maybe given that recognition and, and maybe had more opportunity to reflect on uh, continuing that practice? And maybe specifically with jumping over your own shadow, as you mentioned that one. Do you mean like the learning that comes after earning the badge or? Yeah, about what the achievement means Yeah. Well, like as I already kind of said with the jumping over my own shadow badge, like this was like a idea of because I noticed when I started the internship that it was for hard for me to like put something in a chat where everybody in the company can see it in the co-op. Um, so I like started writing private messages to Laura because I knew her before. And this was my first jumping over my own shadow. And since then, I started doing all these things. People keep asking me, you want to do this? Do you want to give this talk over there? Or do you want to go on this panel? Or, And it, it kept encouraging me to do more and more that is jumping over my own shadow and like pursuing a path somehow to like, yeah, into a career, I don't know. It'll be nice to issue that badge multiple times. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Really good. Crystal, do you want to add anything? Um, well, I can reflect on what I've seen. And so I just walked a, a student through their experiences. And when they recognized how talented and how skilled they were, there's a different set, a different seat to how um, they spoke to me, right? The empowerment was palpable. Um, that's what I see from before they recognize their own skill sets to after. It's this sense of empowerment, this sense of possibility. And that's just an incredible perspective when you're in higher education or in the community. Thanks, Crystal. I've got a question for Noah um, and potentially Nan as well. But um, does anyone have any other questions before I ask that? Don does. It's a um, question about portability. Um, these badges are a great, great way to recognize yourself, a great way to say may, maybe anchor stories you might want to tell about yourself. Are any of them, how many of them are technically portable that somebody else would look at and be impressed by and want to use for evaluating you? And you know, maybe it's a sort of a specious question, but I just wanted to ask it. So uh, the question, as far as I understand it, is to what extent does that make sense to people at a distance? Is that? Yeah. So it makes sense to the learner, it makes sense to the people around them, but does it make sense to the people? How portable is it? No, do you want to take that one? I, know one thing that I can share about that is uh, just sort of as a design question, really just asking people who cares, you know, before we're doing this, and does the learner care? Is there an audience who's you know not the creator of the credential or you know their mom who's bound by social contract to love them unconditionally who's going to care you know is there an authentic you know audience who might care and one just analogy i have is i had an uber ride where you know had a chance to he, he was asking what i work on and was sharing it with him and then i said well, what do you do other than drive an uber he's like well actually i'm a general manager for 13 area golden corrals which is a buffet restaurant in the united states and and i said great you know what if you could get a trusted credential from a prospective employee that was issued by Country Buffet, uh, a comp competing restaurant, for shows up on time or lets you know ahead of time if they're going to be late? He's like, hired. That's all I need to know. Does this exist? Because if that exists, like, they skip the interview, done. They can start tomorrow. And so I, I, I don't, I, that might be a long way and maybe a tangential way of answering your question, Don, of, you know, I think that, you know, and that might also be a little uh, treading on open recognition, but I think that 
thinking about the value proposition, the currency of a credential of the now what, you know, I, I think can be really helpful and can also be a simplifying factor as well. Um, I just want to jump in there and, and um, uh, sort of pick up on what Crystal said around self-recognition and how important that is for portability. Because to be able to recognize in yourself that, wow, I have these skills, but also, oh, I've got these credentials for these skills that I didn't realize I had, and now I can share them. So, for example, um, with the healthcare workers we work with in Texas, uh, one of the techniques in mapping, so you map, you map a number of different things. You map learning experiences, work experiences, what they think their skills are, what they think their credentials are, like, so you have maps upon maps upon maps, right, in these workshops. Uh, what's really interesting is how we talk about credentials is not how a lot of other people talk about credentials um, and so for them to for individuals to recognize in themselves these certain skills and that they're actually linked to certain kinds of credentials the transitions work I'm going to talk about tomorrow the number one credential that was most important for everyone in the study for transition was a recommendation letter uh, and also from that recommendation letter reading someone else's um, uh, evaluation of you helps you recognize that you have those skills and then how you talk about it in interviews. So the ability to have the language of skills or the language of credentials I think is the most portable thing that we can gift you know, uh, in this technology and this innovation. Um, so that's why it's important to bring learners and earners along with us with the language. Uh, and hat tip to Crystal on that one around the importance for self-recognition for portability. It's interesting because the work I did on mobile learning a while ago, um, there's the mobility of the learner and there's the mobility of the technology. So in this situation, the mobility of the technology, aka the badge, um, allows people who are maybe more introverted to be able to show themselves at a distance in a way that maybe they couldn't do before. So you can show someone a badge instead of having to talk about the thing itself. And that's sometimes easier for people to do. Um, Anna, do you want to come in on that or Crystal? Or should we move on? Um, well, I want to um, remind us not to forget the value of seeing other people too. That's something I, I actually learned from Serge. And that's one of the ways we've also used open recognition within our program, right? We, we made a space to say to our partners, we see you. And so they understand the value that, that the partnership is bringing. And so that recognizing others, um, the ability to share and show your value has been something also that our campus has seen benefit from because our partners now understand their role in this project with us. So it, it's a two-way street. Not only do we recognize um, skill and development and experience, but also the opportunity to recognize um, partnerships and to be seen. To be seen is hugely important in society. It's actually one of uh, our <laughs> Maslow's hierarchies, right? That this actualization element is we all want to be seen and recognized for what we bring to a table. Absolutely. Shall we have one more question? Um, maybe, I don't know, someone in the corner of the room might have a question about AI or... Something like that, yeah. Kerry. Yeah. yeah. Anyone? Yeah. Oh, look, Kerry's got a question about AI and sat in the corner of the room. I don't know if it's really a question. Is it okay? I, I was just sitting here thinking, uh, observe, thinking about what we uh, have been talking about all day and how we've been talking about humans understanding these credentials, right? Um, so like me giving a credential to Doug and Doug recognizing me. But we haven't really talked very much about yet is what happens when the machines read this data and put it together. Um, we just had a big um, AI initiative, or not an initiative, but I guess a project in the US where a lot of this happened. Uh, Julie and, and Crystal, I think, were part of this too. So um, I don't know if this is a question, but I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts about like AI and, and the work that you're doing. Does anyone want to take that in particular? Uh, Noah's hands going up, kind of. And I, I have a very short answer, just specific to where I'm starting to see it show up in 
you're in higher ed is um, the, there's vendor platforms that are introducing AI that when we're creating a new badge template, it can basically help us say, uh, what am I doing no, wrong? Doing oh, you're doing it. Uh, <laughs> it can help us uh, do our work more quickly. That it, it can look at you know, the initial information and start to suggest uh, possible, you know, where the template's going. So basically, something that right now maybe takes me 30 minutes might, with the help of AI, take me more like four minutes. And so that, that's, I know not exactly what you were asking, not at all what you were asking, Carrie, but that's like a very practical thing that I'm expecting to start hitting my workflows in, in you know, as early as February. Um, yeah, I Uh, okay. Oh, all right. So we're going to be talking about this tomorrow. Um, there's an XPU um, panel, so I won't talk too much about it. But the Open Recognition Group actually came up with this idea of an AI where you can tell your story to it, and then your work story, and then it would be basically, you know, mapped onto skills taxonomies and machine readable. And what you know, Crystal brought to the table was the ethics of this. So I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow, particularly with um, vulnerable populations. Yeah. So Perrine wants to crash the panel. Here we go. Yes, sorry, but uh, there is uh, one answer to your, to your question, Carrie, and it's uh, this European initiative on cloud that, that is called GaiaX, but also organizes a data transfer between spaces. So data spaces, but how to transfer the skills from one to another. And this comes from, from a French uh, initiative from the Ministry of National Education who brought up EdTech together. And so we have it at French level and European level to screen all those data and, and give to the person in the end a proposal of a new training or you know, a, a small resume of what he did, what he could do, <laughs> and uh, of course job offers. So yes, there are people working on the data with um, European framework, frameworks like ESCO and others. Um, and if, if you want to meet them, <laughs> we are working together too. Thank you. Okay, it is three minutes to six. We've made it, yeah? Okay. So can I just, can you join me in thanking our panelists? So Noah and Kelly and Anna and also Crystal. Thank you very much. <laughs>